I was 17 when this occurred. I have never seen a horror movie that was as scary as what happened to me on this night. It was late, after midnight. My dad and stepmother were asleep. While playing online games, I decided to visit the kitchen to get some water. The house was dark, which wasn't unusual, but walking through a dark house is never that much fun. Our faucet had a nice water filter installed, and the tap water that went through it actually tasted really good, like Fiji bottled water. I stood at the faucet, filling my huge glass. The window directly in front of me overlooked our huge backyard, and directly behind our backyard was a church. The only thing separating them was an old wooden fence that was just about to fall down when the next big storm hit. As my glass filled with water, I scanned the backyard, always paranoid that I might see something. A few times I did see something, but it was always just a cat, just a random cat from our neighborhood. Well, this night, I saw something else. Not a cat. I saw a woman standing with her back to the fence on the far side of my backyard. All she was doing was looking up at me. Now, honestly, the terror that came over me was far beyond what you might expect in this situation. After focusing my eyes, I saw that she was looking at me, but from that distance, I can't be 100% sure. But she looked as if she had been caught, the way she stood with her back to the fence, almost like she was hoping her stance and her non-movement would hide her. She had long brown hair, looked to be at least 50 years old, and was wearing some kind of nightgown. I froze looking at her, no rational thought entering my mind for at least 30 seconds. Then, she started slowly walking towards me. Her steps were very slow, like she was walking on eggshells. The only thing that entered my mind after I saw this was my dad. I turned around and ran up to his bedroom. I knocked on the door, determined, and I heard him and my stepmom move around in bed. My dad's groggy voice was then heard. What? I said through the door, There's a woman in our backyard, I'm not joking. He could hear the fear in my voice and was leading me to the kitchen seconds later. As he looked out the window in the kitchen, he saw nothing. She was gone. He did believe me, because like I said, my voice was proof enough. I was not messing around. He went into the backyard with his flashlight and again found nothing. He asked what she was wearing. Was she stealing stuff? But I had little answers for him. A while later, we both went back to our rooms. He probably fell right back to sleep, but I laid in my dark bedroom for hours thinking of the possibilities. Maybe she would open my bedroom door at any second. Maybe she was about to murder my parents. Maybe this. Maybe that. Nothing happened. About a week or so later, my dad was driving me to school, and imagine my utter shock. We see the woman walking on the sidewalk a few blocks down with some man. After telling my dad that I was freaking positive that it was her, he turned around and pulled up next to her. He got out of his car, and the woman and man stopped to face him. I heard my dad say, Were you in my backyard a few nights ago? The woman looked at him like he was insane. The man that was with her did the same. My dad then told her everything that I had said, and she swore up and down that we made a mistake. I am telling you right now, with nothing to gain from lying, this was her. The woman was in my backyard at like one in the morning. We never saw her again. This is easily the weirdest thing that has ever happened in my life. I think about it often. Every single time I watch or hear about anything even remotely scary or creepy. I see her, standing against my fence, her eyes wide, 
looking into mine. Throughout my life, I have seen this figure no matter where I go. It never really scared me. I just found it creepy until today. I am 18 years old, and due to the virus, we have resorted to staying inside. My sleep schedule has changed immensely over the past few weeks, in which I stay up until 4 a.m., wake up around 1 p.m., and then take a few naps throughout the day. Today I had decided to be a bit more productive, working out and cleaning to keep from being bored and going crazy. After doing a few things around the house, I decided to treat myself to a nap. So off I went into my room, closed the curtains, and I laid in bed. While sleeping, I began to dream about my mom and I getting into a huge fight out front of our home. My mom's dog was outside with us, while my dog was inside watching us with the door halfway open. I suddenly turned around to look at my dog, and saw the figure behind her getting closer and closer to her. I tried going inside to get her, but the door was slammed in my face. Now this might not seem scary to a lot of people, but my dog has gotten me through so many hard times. I used to be suicidal and have suffered with anorexia and body dysmorphia throughout my life, so the thought of one thing I love the most being hurt kills me, and it tears me up inside. I suddenly woke, but it was so weird. I could look around the room, but I couldn't feel my eyes open, and I couldn't blink. My body felt like a mixture of numbness and not being there. It felt like my bed was swallowing me, and my skin was super glued in place. I don't know how else to describe the terror that I felt. While frantically looking around my room, my eyes were frozen on one corner. I couldn't move my eyes into another direction. The more I looked, the more my vision was able to make out this figure. It's almost like it could sense my fear and was feeding off of it, because it started to get bigger. All I could make out was its face was white, and it had a sharp smirk on its face. The bigger it got, the more the walls caved in. I tried moving so much, and was putting all my strength into at least being able to scream for help, as I knew my mom was in the room next to me. I couldn't talk. I never felt more helpless in my life. The numbness in my body was getting stronger. It was two feet away from my bed, when I was finally able to crawl out from my bed. I don't know why, but I struggled so much just to be able to wrap my hand around the doorknob and get out of the room. The only way I am able to describe sleep paralysis is like feeling like you are a part of your bed and knowing something is out to get you, and the rest is nothing you can do because you are a part of the bed and beds don't move. I apologize if this doesn't sound like a good explanation, but I just had to get this off my chest because I really don't want to go back to sleep tonight. This happened when I was about 12 years old. My parents had dropped me and my brother off at home. Since my parents had to go somewhere, they had opened up the garage so that we could go through the back door. However, we found that the back door was locked. That wasn't surprising seeing as my family had been out of town the week prior. Neither my brother or I had a phone at the time, so we went to the neighbor's house to see if we could borrow his phone. He didn't answer when I knocked, which I suppose was not out of the norm because he was a doctor and was usually out of town. My brother and I ended up waiting until my parents got home later. A policeman came by our house a few days later. We ended up finding out that the reason our neighbor hadn't answered the door wasn't because he was out of town. It was because somebody stabbed him to death. There was a huge investigation. The details are fuzzy, seeing that this happened a good five years ago, but I do remember that they did end up catching the guy who killed him. I don't remember his name, though. My family and I still live in the same house, and we've recently gotten some new neighbors. It's a real shame what happened to our original neighbor, because he was a really nice man. 
What really bothers me is not knowing if the new neighbors know that somebody was brutally stabbed to death in their house. I don't feel it's my place to tell them. My name is Jason. I work in a local clothing store. We basically sell stuff that people think is really fancy, but it's basically the same stuff you can find at any clothing store. Even places like Walmart or Goodwill sometimes. I've had this job for about two years now, and while it isn't the greatest, a job is a job. I get to earn enough money to be able to have some independence from my parents, which is really nice. The story took place in the winter of last year. It was a good while after Christmas, but I don't remember exactly when it happened. I just remember there being snow on the ground the next morning after it all went down. So, I work pretty unusual hours for a college student. I know I'm technically a full-time student, but it doesn't feel like I have a whole lot of classes. Maybe I picked an easy major, or maybe I'm a genius. Who knows? But I don't really study, and I barely do the homework, and I still manage to get pretty good grades. On this day, I remember there being a very strange looking man that started coming in the store. He didn't seem like the usual kind of customer that we would get. Most of the people that shop at the store are at least upper middle class. I don't mean to say that they were rich or anything, but if you have enough money to buy expensive clothes, I'm talking like $50 for a t-shirt then you're probably doing pretty well for yourself. But not this guy. This guy looked like he was two steps away from being homeless. He had this really pale hair. Most of it was covered under a dingy black hat, and you could only see this white hair as it stuck out from a few places under the hat. He was an older guy, but not too old. Probably around 50 years old. But judging by how much of a weirdo he was, I guess I can't really be all that sure. He started coming in every single day, and he always bought something. It was not always something big. Sometimes it was a $70 pair of pants. Other times it was a really expensive watch. However, with as much stuff as he bought, he never seemed to wear any of it. At least not from any of the times I've ever seen him. He always dressed in a baggy sweatshirt or really old, worn-out overalls with a denim jacket on top. And the denim jacket had cuts and holes and looked really weird, because his overalls would be denim too. I don't know if he thought that it went well as an outfit, but I wasn't about to tell this guy that he dressed stupidly. After all, I did get a commission for everything that I sold in the store. However much of a creep that he may have been, I will gladly welcome his business. I know the really weird thing I noticed about him was that he never actually tried on the clothes that he was buying. Like, ever. He would spend 40 minutes analyzing a pair of pants, hold it in front of himself in the mirror, feel the texture, and try to look at it from different points of view. But he would never actually go into the dressing room and try them on. I thought that was the weirdest thing of all. I also remember the couple of times he wouldn't buy the item that he had been looking at, and there would always be this really musky smell to them. I know this may sound weird, but out of morbid curiosity, I would smell clothes after people tried them on after the store had closed. I can't really smell much otherwise, like I had seen this guy at least 20 different times, and never got a smell of him. But whenever I did smell the clothes that he had been looking at, I could smell some strange combination of body odor and smoke. I got really curious about what he does when he isn't randomly buying clothes at an expensive and overpriced store like this one. There was also this one time that he came into the store and specifically asked for me. I thought that was pretty weird, considering that he had never really struck up a conversation with me or anything. Of all the times I had interacted with him, it was always on a very formal basis, and we both said the bare minimum necessary. It was obvious that he didn't like coming to the store, and I found myself drawing a blank coming up with reasons as to why he kept on doing it. I didn't think too much of it though. I was a college student, and anything outside of chilling with my friends and getting my assignments done 
didn't really matter all that much to me. I remember this one night that I was doing laundry. I normally hate doing laundry, but I specifically remember putting my clothes into the washing machine. I got a whiff of one of my sweatshirts that I had thought smelled really weird. I smelled my sweatshirt again, and I knew immediately what the smell was. It was that same body odor smoke smell that came from that man. The next day I was working my shift as usual, and here comes in the same old guy. This time he was checking out a pair of shoes. It was a pair of Crocs. I didn't understand why we had Crocs in the store in the first place. They were exactly the same ones that you could get at Walmart, except for the fact that we charged $60 for them instead of $15. Well, this guy spent about 45 minutes looking at this pair of Crocs before he decided it was time to head out. He came up to my register and took an unusually long period of time to pay for his Crocs. It wasn't until he was reaching for his wallet and paying that I remembered something. I totally forgot that I don't wear my sweatshirt at work. It's against the rules. You have to dress kind of nice, which normally meant like a polo shirt or a decent dress shirt. Something that you could throw a vest over and look like a halfway decently dressed representative of a fashion store. It got me on this whole train of thought that made me realize that my sweatshirt didn't smell that way because I was spending too much time with this weird guy. He must have somehow gotten a hold of my sweatshirt on his own accord. I remember my heart falling into the pit of my stomach when I made the realization. I felt myself turn red and started to sweat. However, freaked out as I became, he took no notice. Just kept paying for his goofy pair of green Crocs. If you ever smelled the smell I'm talking about, you would understand just how distinct it really was. I mean, there was nothing in the world like it. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there was a good possibility that this guy was creeping on me somehow, maybe even getting into my house. I quit my job that day, on the spot. I didn't want to put myself in jeopardy for a goofy retail job especially because that guy showed no sign of ever slowing down. He was there every single day that I worked. A couple weeks after the incident, I asked some of my former co-workers if they had noticed if the guy was still coming in. They told me that they don't remember exactly when, but he stopped coming in right about the time I stopped working there. This only made me more paranoid about the whole situation. I have developed a couple of possible theories as to what exactly was going on with this guy, but none of them really make any sense. I've tried telling a couple of my family members about it, but they all think that I'm just trolling them. To this day, I still have not figured out what exactly happened, and I'm honestly kind of worried that I will never know what this creepy guy at the retail store was doing there every day, or why he stopped going after I quit. This took place in late 2016. It was a dark December evening, winter break from school. My then girlfriend Liz and I were cuddled up on the couch watching Christmas movies on Netflix with my two young nephews, five years old and ten months at the time. My mother was at work and my girlfriend's mom was running errands. My little sister was at an after school center across the street from our house. The movie we were watching I think was Elf and it was still playing. I was getting really bored from it and got up to get a drink. Before I got to the refrigerator, the doorbell rang. I walked into the living room and looked through the peephole on the front door. I see a man, about mid-forties, and dressed in a dark brown winter coat. I asked who it was. It's Vince from down the street. Can I come in? I opened the door. Luckily, our screen door was locked so he couldn't get in. Uh, my mom isn't here. What do you need? I asked as politely as I could. Your mom wanted me to clean the gutters. She promised to pay me. Can I come in? I shook my head. Why would my mom want a man to clean the gutters when she has me? More so, why would she want him to do it at a time like this? 
My mom isn't home. She'll be back later, I said. The man groaned lightly in irritation. Well, can you call her? Sorry, my phone is dead, I lied. He nodded without another word and turned. To leave, I assumed. I closed the door and sat back down. Not two minutes later, another knock was at the door. I went to look through the peephole and was unable to see anyone. Who is it? I called out. It's me, my little sister said. The program must have been over. I opened the door and almost jumped out of my skin. The man was standing right behind my sister. I quickly unlocked the screen door and hurried my sister inside. He tried to get in, but I shut and locked both doors just in time. I asked her if she was okay. Yeah, but that man keeps asking where mom is. I felt my stomach drop. Why is this guy so persistent? My sister started to call my mom to tell her, but then the lights shut off. It made us all let out a gasp. Also freaked us out more than before. Her phone then died as soon as she pressed the call button. Weird, since her battery wasn't even close to dead. Not long after that, the movie was over and my oldest nephew was asleep. I was trying to get the baby boy to sleep when my girlfriend's mom came through the door. She looked weirded out. Mom, what's wrong? Liz asked. The man outside tried to get into the car with me. Hearing that made my heart stop. I gave my nephew to my girlfriend and looked out the window. He was standing by our mailbox, looking at me. At this point, I bet you're guessing I called the police, right? Wrong. I just stared at him. This next part haunts my nightmares to this day. He gave me a wide, open mouth grin and widened his eyes. I never told my girlfriend this because I didn't want to scare her. My breathing was heavy at this point. He then turned around slowly and walked down the street. I never heard from him again. To most, that doesn't seem scary at all, but I bet if a man you never seen before knocked on your door and tried to come in, asking countless times for your mother on a freezing December night, you'll be scared shitless too. I told my mom about the man when she got home, and she looked at me crazy. I don't know any vents from around this area. We used to live in a small two-bedroom apartment, and my four-year-old son would sometimes get scared and sleep in my room. One morning I was waking up but still in bed and groggy. I saw a man from the back in what looked like a black jacket walking from our closet and exiting the bedroom. I was convinced that I was dreaming, so I tried to go back to sleep. My son, who was awake by then, said, Mom, you're here. I looked at him and said, of course I am, where else would I be? Then who was that walking out of the room? My son said. I ran out to the living room to see if someone was there, but no one was. The door was completely unlocked. I looked out in the hall, and no one was there. I thought that maybe it was a maintenance man who let themselves in, but they had a strict policy that I would have to let the maintenance man in to do any work so that was an unlikely explanation. I never found out who it was. I had a good childhood for the most part. I grew up in a neighborhood that had plenty of kids my age to play with. There was a lake with a rope swing for hot summer days. Growing up in Florida, a shady, cool lake was a welcome reprieve. My grandma even lived next door to us, and it was nice having her close by. When I was 12, things started to take a sinister turn. The first thing I remember happening was one night I was laying in my bed watching TV, and my closet door swung open, hit the wall, and then slammed shut. I ran to the living room where my parents were, and in tears, told them what had just happened. As parents sometimes don't, they didn't believe me. That night as I tried to fall asleep I heard something bang on our utility room door. 
It sounded like something was trying to break it down. Real quick, let me give you this setup of my house. It was basically a long hallway with rooms off of either side. You could stand at the front door and see the back door. My dad added a utility room workshop when I was about eight, and it made the house look huge. The actual living area was really small, though. Because of how small the house was, I heard the banging loud and clear. I screamed for my parents, and they both came running in my room. I told them what I heard, and my dad went out to check it out, while my mom tried to calm me down. My dad found nothing, and I ended up sleeping in their room that night. After that, the activity in the house really picked up. We would find things completely out of place. Car keys would be in the kitchen. A vase that was on the bookshelf in the living room would be in the bathroom. Just objects out of place everywhere. This was also when I started seeing a black figure at my bedroom door. At first, it would just stand there and stare into my room. I told my mom about it and she said I must have been dreaming. I was not dreaming. I was wide awake. Soon the figure started coming into my room, closer and closer to my bed. It was terrifying. One night I got up the nerve to try to run past it. It didn't touch me that I could see, but I was pushed back onto my bed with such force that my head hit the wall between my room and my parents' room. My mom came rushing in to see what happened, and I told her. She looked at me with concern, and told me to just come sleep in their room. I continued to see this figure at least three times a week, until I was like fifteen. One day I had had enough, and I went to talk to my grandma. I just told her what I had seen and described what it looked like. She had said that she thought it was my grandfather, her husband. She told me that he had been an abusive drunk, getting his thrills from scaring his children, and being physically abusive to her. I asked why she didn't leave him, and she said that she tried twice. The first time he found her at her sister's house alone, and threatened to kill her if she tried it again. The second time he found her, and she said that he almost did kill her. She wouldn't go into how, though. After I talked to her, the activity stopped. Just like that. No more. I never saw the figure again. When I was 21, my mom died of brain cancer. The activity picked up again. One day I was playing PlayStation in my room, and I smelled her perfume. Lady in white. It was her favorite. Once again, items around the house would go missing, and would be found later in weird places like the bathroom closet. I worked overnights, and one morning I came home to find my mother in the kitchen, in the dress that she had been buried in, just standing there. She was looking right at me. She smiled, and then was gone. I continued to live with my dad, and when I was 24, started dating the girl that I am now married to. One evening I got off work at 10 p.m., and we decided to go out. She came to my house to pick me up, and as I was getting my stuff together, we were standing in the living room. She said, What the hell is that? I looked up, and on the ceiling, there were brightly colored circles going in a circle right above our heads. Remember the door I heard pounding on? Well, while we were looking at the circles dancing around, that door fell. Just fell right off the hinges that had held it in place for 16 years and landed right in the middle of the hallway. We walked over to the door and just stood there staring at it, and then we got the hell out of there. My dad had been on a business trip, and when he came home, I told him what happened. I could tell that he really didn't believe me, but considering that I wasn't the partying type, or someone who just took doors off hinges, he didn't really know what else to think. He put the door back up on the same hinges, all the while muttering that he didn't see how it could have just fallen off. After that, my girlfriend's cousin had gotten married, and quite a bit of her family had come for the wedding. Two of her cousins that hadn't seen her in years ended up coming back to my house with the two of us, and we had some drinks, listened to music, and just had our own little party. Her cousin Terry had to use the bathroom, 
and when he came back, he asked if we recently had the bathroom redone. We had, but there was no way that he could have known that. He started walking around the house and was saying things like, That end table used to be in that corner, didn't it? When he got to my parents' room, he said, Your mom or a motherly figure is in here. He then described her to a T. At this time, my dad and I had pretty much packed up her pictures, and there were none of my mom out anywhere that he could have seen. He described my mother sleeping with a knife in her bed, which was believable since she and my dad had a pretty hostile relationship when he drank too much. He also described what our kitchen had looked like before we had it redone. Still no clue how he knew all of this. One night my girlfriend stayed the night at my home when my dad was on a business trip, and since it was bigger, we slept in my parents' bed. At about 4 a.m. she woke me up, completely petrified, and told me that she just saw my mom standing by the closet. Another time my girlfriend was sick and left work early. She came to my house and I went to go get her medicine. When I got back, she was asleep on the couch covered with a quilt. I just assumed that she had gotten it off my bed. When she finally woke up, I gave her the medicine, and she thanked me for covering her up. I told her that I didn't do that, and she said that she certainly did not. I have lived in four different places since that time, and in each of those places, something weird has always happened. I don't know if it's attached to me, or if I just happened to get all of the weirdo houses. This was back in the early 2000s. I was employed working a second job as a Sears delivery and setup driver. I actually worked with my cousin Michael, whom was two years older than me. He helped me actually get the job. This was back when Sears was delivering and assisting in setup of appliances such as washer and dryers, air conditioners, and such. My cousin was mainly the driver, and I was the guy helping to unload the appliances and assist him in setting anything up, getting the delivery signed off, etc. This particular Sears was in our hometown, and I actually could walk to the store location from my apartment at the time. If memory recalls correctly, this particular day was a Friday, and we started delivering around 8 a.m. We had a certified work truck, a 2005 Ford F-150, fantastic for any terrain. This delivery was actually our second one of the morning. We had finished our first two deliveries fairly quickly, and everything was going very smooth. I enjoyed working with my cousin, as we had a close friendship, and we gelled well together. We were both young and in great shape, so this job was a breeze, and we loved getting out of the store and driving around. So this particular third delivery was a ways out of town. In actuality, it was very far out in the country, located where the Amish would reside. So in preparation, after the refrigerator was properly loaded and secured, we set the Garmin GPS for the location and headed out. We stopped by a gas station to use the company card to refuel, and we made sure to use the restroom and buy beverages for the trip. Now, this location we were delivering to was absolutely out of the area we were used to delivering to, a very small remote rural community known as Jasper. Jasper is located in between two other rural areas with population literally less than 300 inhabitants. Neither Michael or I have ever been through this area, and surprisingly, the GPS had no issues guiding us to our destination. Passing through wooded areas on both sides of us, we began commenting on how the area looked similar to the setting of Resident Evil 4. Nothing but abandoned woodland area, peppered with hay barrels left rusting and farmhouses decaying into disrepair. The GPS led us to Incline Hill, and we saw two houses on both ends, a forked road splitting into two directions. We could tell that the house assigned to deliver was the house on our left. This was a very out of place looking home for a country setting. The house was a two-story, almost gothic architecture, painted black trim and off-gray. 
The windows were small for the style of the house, and it had double the amount of windows for a house of its usual design. Michael approached the driveway, backed the truck in, and we shut the ignition off. We hopped out, and I grabbed the paperwork for the delivery and approached the front door. It was still light out in spring, and only around 11.30 a.m., so everything was bright out, despite being such a desolate area. I knocked on the front door, and Michael waited by the truck drinking a Gatorade, waiting on the signature and the go-ahead to unstrap the fridge and begin the delivery. Upon knocking, Michael called out to me and pointed at the window to my left. He said, Do you see the girl at the window, bro? Michael had apparently saw a young teenage girl staring at us through the curtains. I shrugged it off, simply thinking that she may not have been aware that her parents had purchased a new fridge and was surprised to see us there. A woman had answered the door at this point. She was very skinny and petite, almost malnourished looking, with thin black hair and an almost too calm demeanor. She looked at me, then at Michael, and asked us to come in. Actually, ma'am, if you could sign off for us, we will get this fridge unloaded for you and hook it up within the hour. She then just looked at me with an almost confused, disheveled expression. I was at this point getting very strange vibes from this woman. Are you Elena? I asked, looking at my paperwork, just to make double sure that we had the correct address. Yes, she responded and literally tore the clipboard out of my hand, signed her name, in what I can only describe to be the most eloquent script cursive I have ever seen. Wow, ma'am, that is some beautiful penmanship, I complimented. I looked back and Michael nodded and let the tailgate down. He hooked the guide rails on for us to ease the appliance off the truck. The appliances were still in their boxes, and guiding them off was always the easy part. It was carrying them upstairs on the dolly that was always an adventure in of itself. But both of us being young and in pretty decent physical shape, despite myself being quite short in stature, provided to be a fun workout in its own weird way. We got the fridge on the porch with relative ease, and the woman held the door for us. Upon entering the living room, I stopped guiding the fridge with a dolly and paused a moment. Whoa, I exclaimed, enamored with the interior of the home. The gothic style architecture of the exterior was only the beginning. This home had literal statues of castles and even a couple gargoyles were mounted on both sides of a beautiful grandfather clock. Paintings of nighttime settings were on the walls and an area rug of a pentagram star was aligned with tall candles and some rather impressive looking plants and flowers. This odd clash of feng shui, as I could describe, was both off-putting yet beautiful at the same time. An oxymoron of an illustration I admit, yes, but I can't put it any other way. The woman, Elena, told us the kitchen was to the right and that there was an outlet already ready for this setup. However, she asked Michael to come upstairs as she wanted his opinion on a washer-dryer room and was inquiring about what she should buy that would fit dimensional-wise in the room. He looked at me clearly asking with his expression if I mind unboxing the refrigerator and hooking it up by myself. A refrigerator is a lot easier to set up on your own than a washer, so I shrugged and said, Yeah, bro, go help her out. I got this. Michael nodded, and the woman guided him upstairs. I began carefully cutting the cardboard open with my box cutter, and folding up the cardboard neatly in this kitchen for ease of disposing it, and set the fridge up aligning it perfectly against the wall, to begin plugging it in, and getting the rest of the job done. As I was doing this, the teenage girl both Michael and I had seen at the window, appeared in the archway of the kitchen. Her arms were crossed watching me as she leaned against the archway. Her sudden presence out of nowhere startled me, and I let out a quick gasp and chuckled. Oh, you scared me. I'm Jason, just setting up your new fridge for you. Then it dawned on me. Where was the old refrigerator? I hadn't even noticed they didn't have an old refrigerator. I was somewhat baffled by this, as I was pulling the doors out of the fridge to get any excess papers out. 
This girl looked to be around maybe 16 or 17, very skinny and pale. Her hair was thin, much like Elena's, whom I assumed was her mother. This girl looked somewhat like a cross between Kristen Stewart, if you know who that is, and the girl from The Ring. And yes, I'm being serious. However, it was her literal emotionless gaze and utter silence that was beginning to really creep me out. I was done with the duties inside the refrigerator and was plugging it in and gathering the paper and cardboard when I noticed two more children standing behind this girl. A young boy with long brown hair looked to be around 11 and another young girl who looked to be around 7. She looked almost identical to her and I assumed they were sisters, yet the young boy looked almost nothing like either of them, so I was banking on this kid being either a cousin or just a friend. I couldn't figure out why these children were just standing near the kitchen watching me, but it was their complete silence and almost sinister vibes that I was getting seriously creeped out. Is your mom around? I asked the girl, inquiring if she was finished upstairs with Michael so that we could get going. She basically shrugged at me, not uncrossing her arms whatsoever. It was then that I heard running coming down the stairs leading to the second story of the house. It was Michael. He just jetted down the steps, ran to me, and grabbed my arm. We need to leave, now. Michael tugged my arm, looked me dead in the eyes, and said, Get the hell out the front door, now. I was completely startled, and adrenaline started coursing. Michael, my cousin, was a five foot 11 225-pound guy. He was somewhat burly in stature. I know for a fact that he could hold his own. Michael doesn't scare easy, either. We've done a little urban exploring, and even some ghost hunting in the past before. I know Michael, and I have never seen him like this. It was then that I grabbed the clipboard with the signature, and turned to leave with Mike, when the girl and the two kids were actually blocking the doorway. Now I know what you're thinking. Two capable men could easily overpower these three skinny kids. However, the girl uncrossed her arms and revealed what was a syringe. Yes, a syringe. We heard talking coming down the steps. It was Elena, the mother that we assumed. She was saying something along the lines of rituals. And the need for life to be unchained from the common sports that embodies us. Just some crazy, almost witch-like jabbering that didn't actually make sense. At this point, Michael turns and we head through the kitchen to a dining room. We knew we needed to get out the front door, as we had no idea if this house had a back door, if it was locked, or if there was some barricade of some sort. Luckily, the dining room had a direct route around the left opposite side of the living room. Elena, at this point, had reached the living room, and the older teenage girl with the syringe was following us through the dining room at a quickened pace. What was actually in the syringe, we hadn't any idea. If it was a drug that would make us groggy and defenseless? If it was a poison of some sort? Some kind of drain cleaner? Some toxic substance? We didn't have a clue. Michael, at this point, had no choice but to shoulder check Elena, who was blocking the doorway. She was sent into the wall, and Michael darted out the front door. I was close behind, dragging the dolly behind me, managed to make it out the door as the teenage girl was yelling at me, chasing me still with the syringe. I spun around and screamed at the girl to stop where she was, raising the dolly to my chest, showing that I was ready to attack if my demand was not met. She turned around looking at Elena who at this point made it to her feet. I tossed the dolly in the bed of the truck and Michael jumps in and we hauled ass out of there. It was revealed on the drive home that Michael told me in the process of him helping Elena. She began speaking about the ritual of spirits, and of how life itself needed to be minimalized to continue a spiritual existence. Whatever that actually means, we don't know. It was around this time there was another person upstairs neither of us knew about. A man revealed himself, Michael said. A man who was of average height but had a pentagram necklace, long dark hair, shoulder length, and was smiling at Michael, asking if he was willing to assist in the ritual. 
He then opened a door to the upstairs room, showing a bed with candles around the floor, unlit, and was playing soft music on a stereo. When Michael hesitated, the guy whispered, Grab him, to Elena, and that was when Michael ran downstairs. We assumed the girl was blocking the kitchen, but making it not obvious as he waited until I was finished to stick me with whatever was in the syringe. We arrived back at the store immediately, told our boss, and he called the police to go to the address. The cops took our statements and we were contacted a day later. The police visited the home and they were greeted with the same people that we came in contact with. They denied all allegations and were friendly and the police said there was no evidence of anything of the sort. All this aside, Michael and I decided to let it go as we were just happy we were able to think on our feet, defend ourselves, and we narrowly escaped being a part of the ritual. I am a 27 year old female. At the time this occurred, I was in my senior year in high school, angsty and steadily into partying. For this story, I'm going to hide her identity, solely due to privacy. Let's call her Kay. Kay almost cost me my life, and I never want to see her again. A little backstory on Kay. She had grown up privileged, given anything she ever wanted. Her parents adopted her five cousins, and this is when she started to rebel. Her parents were well off, started to pay less attention to her, so Kay had all the freedom in the world. At the time this incident occurred, Kay was 18, and I had just turned 18. We were headed to a kickback at these guys' house, and nothing more than a little bit of weed was expected. Now I had my share in smoking weed and popping pills here and there. I had just tried ecstasy the summer prior. However, I was planning on staying sober. Shay picked me up, and we stopped to buy cigarettes at a gas station. I bought a fountain drink, one with the straw and everything. This is crucial for the story, later on. We arrive at the apartment, and everyone is smoking, including Kay, but I declined. She would always say stuff about how she never wanted to be high alone, complained about how I never got as high as her, so I obliged and I cleared the bong off her hit, not even taking a full hit. She asked for a drink of my soda and I handed it to her. She had it for a good minute. I had my head turned talking to someone else at the kickback. When I looked back at Kay, she was messing with my straw. I didn't think much of it and she handed it back to me. Within about 30 minutes or so, I started to feel intensely high, to the point that I needed to escape from the group. I go out front to smoke a cigarette, only to find that I couldn't stand up. So I laid on the front porch. Then all of these dark thoughts flashed through my mind. I felt so sick, like my stomach was being torn open. I couldn't stand up. I had to crawl to the bushes to throw up. I thought to myself, all of this? Off clearing a bong? So I laid back on the porch. The apartment was located on a busy street in the city I lived in. I also thought about running into traffic, because I felt like I was dying. So I gave myself two options. I could run into traffic, have a car hit me, and end this horrible pain I was in. Or I could get some help, maybe flag somebody down. My mind wasn't in the right state. I knew nobody at the kickback would take me seriously, but I knew something was terribly wrong. I thought about calling my mom. I must have dialed her number and hung up like five times. Finally, I called and told her what had happened, and that I didn't know why I was so high. Nobody else was feeling the way that I felt. What seemed like an eternity later, Kay came outside looking for me. As I'm puking my guts out into the bushes, she asks me if I want to go get some food. I asked her if she was serious. She laughed as I puked. What I didn't know is that my mother had called my older brother to pick me up, since he lived close to where I was. He showed up with a machete, ran inside and threatened people. He didn't know who gave me what. 
It wasn't until I got home that my brother took one look at me. He saw my eyes and noticed how dilated my pupils were. So they rushed me to the ER. After more puking, of course. My memory there is a bit fuzzy. I just remember asking my sister-in-law if I was going to die and telling her that I was scared. They ended up sedating me due to the fact that I was yelling and threatening the nurses, which was completely out of character for me. They did a drug test screen on me and found MDMA, the drug found in ecstasy, along with other drugs in my system. I'm assuming the other drugs were the ones used to make up the ecstasy. Now, this is all frightening and everything. However, what I found out a few days later shocked me to my core. Kay had been to a house party the next night. Somebody there had said that she was passing out free ecstasy to four different people. Of those four people, three had horrible seizures and had to be taken to the ER by ambulance. I'm assuming that whatever ecstasy she used was a bad batch. Remember when she asked to have a drink of my soda? I assume that this is when she dropped the pill inside and it dissolved. She probably crushed it beforehand or something, I have no clue. But at this time in my life I hadn't done drugs for a while, especially not ecstasy. Kay also went on to tell people that I was the one that slipped her the drug and she had to go to the hospital. She's a pathological liar and has had to go to therapy for a long time for mental disorders. All of this happened because she wanted me to be high like her. I could have committed suicide because I wasn't in the right frame of mind. It still affects me to this day. It sounds cliche, but I have hard time trusting people with this experience among other things. I also don't like sharing drinks with people. I get scared when I go out to a bar or a club, fearing the worst. I mean, if my own friend has done this to me, what's stopping a stranger? So I always guard my drink, no matter what, and I'll never see Kay again. I'm not sure if this was a trendy thing for anyone else in the early to mid 2000s, but when I was a child during this time, it appeared that many characters in books and films and TV shows had pen pals distant figures with whom they were best friends, and to whom they scribed whatever was going on in their lives. One of these TV shows actually featured an episode where a girl met up with her pen pal, who turned out to not be a French boy her age, but a creepy middle-aged man who shoved her in the back of his van. Apparently I didn't let this sway me from seeking out a pen pal of my own, however. I searched pen pals in Google, and clicked on the first few sites. The one that I settled on already had a list of children's names, ages, locations, small bios, and an email address. I scoured the page but couldn't find anyone my age. The youngest girl was Lot, age 12, from Amsterdam. So I clicked on her email address and tapped out a cheerful message, telling her that I was Pepe from HR from the UK, and that I was only 8, that I was really mature for my age, and please be my friend online. I remember she responded very quickly. I remember that she told me that it didn't matter that I was eight. She liked younger girls. Better anyway. Retrospectively, that's creepy to say, but I was eight and naive. We struck up a friendship, and we would email back and forth. I told her everything. About my annoying friends at school, my parents who fought all the time, my love for Jacqueline Wilson books, and Doctor Who. Like the idiot that I was, I told her what country I lived in, and the town. I didn't give her my address, but I was stupid enough to send her a picture of myself. She didn't send anything back, and I didn't think to ask, because once again, I was the idiot. She told me I was really pretty. Things are still a bit fuzzy to remember, but one thing I do remember is that she said she liked my eyes. A few weeks of this goes on, my older sister was the only person who knew. And she told me one day that she wasn't comfortable with this. Because she's only older by a year, I thought I knew better and I brushed her off. But she asked me to tell her mom. I didn't want to, but I had a feeling in my gut that I should. That evening, I told her, putting on my most persuasive voice. I tried to convince her that Lot was really cool and nice. But my mom is protective, and she knew something was wrong. 
She asked to see the emails and told me Lot isn't a girl. She's a man preying on you. Mom pointed out the typing style and the email address. She doesn't even talk like a little girl, she said. See, Lot's email address wasn't simply like at hotmail.com or gmail.com or even Yahoo. It was at something that, according to my mom, looked like a business name, not something that a little girl would have an email with. Her writing style had also changed over the weeks we'd been talking. It had gone from normal typing like a little kid to regular typing. This didn't give my mom a good feeling. She told me to stop emailing Lot. I lied and said I would, but naturally I carried on, but I was still a little unnerved. I emailed Lot a few days later, saying that my mom wanted her mom's email address. She started questioning me why when she replied, but eventually gave it. I was relieved. In hindsight, I should have wondered why she didn't want to give me the email address straight away. Maybe I realized this a little subconsciously, because I asked her for a photo of her and another with her mom. Again, she questioned why and asked if something was wrong. I just told her that my mom wanted to know what she looked like. There was no reply for a few days, but then finally, I get another email from her. Attached were two pictures, one of her and one of her with her mom. They didn't look right. They didn't look like normal pictures. They looked polished and professional. I think by this point the unsettling feeling was too much for even me to handle. I'm not good at shutting things down with someone, even to this day. I can't calmly and slowly end a relationship or friendship. So I replied to the email with the pictures, and wrote that I never wanted to speak to her again. She didn't take it very well. Not well at all, actually. She told me she hated me, and that I was ugly. She said a few other nasty things, but what freaked me out was when she told me she would make me as miserable as I made her. You can guarantee that if I wasn't scared before, I was now. I cried and told my mom, who was upset about me lying, but worried as well. So I guess when she banned me from using the internet for a few weeks, it was actually a protective measure, as well as a punishment. Nothing ended up happening. This made me think that maybe I had freaked out a lot for no reason. Maybe she hadn't lied after all. It was only a year and a bit later when I stumbled upon a new show and found out that those pictures weren't a lot after all. Does anybody remember an Australian show called Mortified? The photos she had sent were actually headshots of the lead actress. At the time I was upset that I had to stop talking a lot, but looking back on it after all these years, it was probably the smartest move I had ever made. I am currently 18 years old. I began messaging this person, Jackson, when I was around 14. I was doing what I always did when I was with my friends. Went on Omegle and see what we would find. Possibly something funny, gross, or something plain interesting. One time there was a guy who messaged saying hello. He didn't have a camera on and we began typing to him. Simple stuff like where was he from and where we were. Harmless. I thought when he began targeting me to talk, he would try to get me to come into the camera's view, and I did. My friend would giggle as I would take over. He called me beautiful, and I exaggerated appreciation for the camera. He asked for my socials, and I give him my kick name, which was highly popular back then. This is where everything goes wrong. I ended up getting home, and a message appeared on my phone. Hey cutie. I got confused until he reminded me he was from Omegle. The conversation was very innocent, him trying to get to know me, asking about where I lived and my interests. I found out he lived in Ireland. I had a pit in my gut subside because he was really far away from me. We began talking daily, so much that I rarely socialized with my actual friends. Soon he began to confess he had a deep feeling for me and wanted to be with me. I told him I don't know what he looks like, who he really is, and said I can't do long distance. He sent a photo of him, he was chubby with brown hair and blue eyes. I replied with cute, because I felt bad and didn't want to make him feel horrible about himself. 
He wasn't my type, but he would be someone's. We spoke a lot more, and he told me he was around 23 years old. I thought that wasn't that bad at all, and nothing crazy like 40. Time flew, and we knew a lot about one another. He followed my Instagrams and liked my stuff, sent me posts from other meme accounts, and it was all fun and innocent. Then one day, out of nowhere, he became sexual with me, saying that he was horny and wanted photos of me, anything to get him off. I told him I don't do that, and didn't respond to him for the rest of the night. The next day I woke up to, I'm sorry, messages, and I forgave him. Stuff like that happens, I thought to myself. This happened quite often. He would get mad at times when I didn't do what he wanted. I rarely sent the guy selfies, let alone naked pictures of my body. At 15, him and I stopped talking. He would add me on my Snapchat. I gave that to him at a later date, when I finally got it. We reconnected once he said he misses me and was sorry, then said he would kill himself he misses me so bad. I freaked out and felt like his life was in my hands. I decided to have small, innocent chats. Time went by and I got older, as he did. I was 16 when I told him I was sick of his games. Sometimes he would disappear for a while, then come back all horny and angry at me. I blocked him on kick, ended up deleting the app as it became unpopular. Blocked him on Snapchat, where he then began to add me over and over with new accounts. I freaked out a lot because on Instagram you can see requested text messages, and he messaged me saying he would find me and show me that he can make me happy. He used to text me saying, answer your effing phone, and I'm sorry, I'm just mad and frustrated. I was so sick of it. I still am. Sometimes he would tell me how he would turn up at my house and surprise me, and I would jump into his arms and be super happy and fall in love with him, like he loved me and professes to me a lot on fake accounts on Instagram. Sometimes he would go dark and tell me horrible things he would do to me, send me naked photos of him and tell me how it was all for me. To this day he still messages me and I'm 18 now. This guy won't leave me alone and I'm so deathly afraid he will actually find me. I know this didn't have a climax or anything insane that happened, but the fear he instilled in my heart is something that I simply can't let go. I've told people about this happening, and this stalking caused them to say, tell the police. But what could they do? He was in Ireland. I knew it for a fact as he found my Facebook, and he'd never done anything physical to me, and I didn't want my mother to find out. I'm just scared one day he'll find me, but I hope he never does. This story is about my uncle and his sleazebag friend. Okay, so he wasn't my blood uncle. He was my biological aunt's brother-in-law. My mom used to date sketchy guys when I was a teen. I didn't live with her much because she was a horrible role model. So my grandmother raised me for a big chunk of my life. I'm thankful for that because she taught me so many values and how to be a lady. I later moved in with my dad and stepmom and half-siblings when I was 15, and I had a wonderful life with them. When I was 14, I lived with my mother and her skeezy boyfriend, Dale, for a year in the upper half of a duplex. Her boyfriend had this friend that would come over very occasionally, that looked just like the white guy from the Jerky Boys. Same hair, too. And he creeped me out because he would always stare at me and I would always catch him creepily staring at my butt and my boobs. My aunt lived down the block that I would visit quite frequently because she was the cool aunt. She was in her 20s, super fun and really pretty, and she had a 1969 Firebird convertible that we would drive around in and blast Aerosmith. This was in the 90s. So with that said, I saw her brother-in-law Jeff quite a bit because he was renting out her basement. I thought he was kind of weird, but an okay guy. So one night, at about 11.30 or midnight, I was home alone, and I get a knock at the door. Our door had a square glass panel towards the top that was painted over, with a little peephole scratched in the paint. I look through, 
and it's my Aunt B's in-law, Jeff. I open the door and I say, oh hey, what's up? He asks me if my mom or Dale is home. I said no, my mom was at work and God knows where Dale is. Then he asked me to come downstairs because he wanted to talk to me. I trusted him because I considered him family, and I was also pretty timid and didn't like saying no to people. So I follow him downstairs to the front porch. I see his car parked and still running on the street with the headlights on, and sitting in the passenger seat with the window rolled down was the jerky boy looking guy that hung out with my mom's boyfriend. I paused and I said, um, and Jeff said, hey, we want to talk to you. We want to ask you something. And he started to gently guide me to the car. My adrenaline started pumping, and I all of a sudden felt that something wasn't right. I stopped and pulled back a little and tried my best not to look scared. Jeff kept talking sweetly, running his finger up my shoulder to fix the spaghetti strap, and saying, it's okay, just come closer to me. And I pulled away politely and said it was okay, he can ask me right here. He kept sweetly trying to convince me to just come to the car so we could just talk, and said that if I was so scared, I could just stand in front of the headlights. The second he said stand in front of the headlights, my stomach did a leap, and my whole body started to feel electrically charged, because I knew if I was to stand in front of the headlights, I would not be able to see, and it would distract me, thus making it easy for one of them to get me. I knew right at that moment I was in a very dangerous situation, so I started acting ditzy and dumb because I was afraid that if they thought I was thinking they were trying to do something that would land them in prison, he would just grab me right there and cover my mouth and drag me to the car so I wouldn't tell on him. So I started to playfully joke around and said that I wasn't wearing shoes and I didn't want to step in dog poop. Then I see Jerky Boy start to come out of his car, and then I just sprinted into the house so fast and ran up the stairs and locked the door. I was shaking so bad. Then the jerky boys knock on the door about a minute later, and he's looking through the makeshift peephole. He starts saying that he needs to talk to my mom's boyfriend. I say that he isn't home, so he goes away from the door, but I didn't hear him go down the stairs. Then 30 seconds later, Jeff comes up and knocks, and is talking through the door saying that he needed to talk to my mom's boyfriend and he tries to open the door but it's locked. I said that he wasn't home, again. So Jeff starts saying things like, I'm sorry we scared you honey, we just wanted to talk to you and ask you about your mom and Dale, and other excuses. I was scared that they were going to try and kick in the door, so I decided that I was going to try and sneak out the back. I walked towards the back door and thank god I looked out the back window first, because I saw Jerky Boy standing downstairs at the back door. So Jeff was at the front door sweet-talking me, and his friend was waiting by the back. I know what you're probably thinking right now hearing this. Call the cops! I don't know why I didn't. I think it was because I was so naive and timid, and this guy was my uncle. I was also questioning myself and judging myself, because Jeff kept reassuring me at the front door. So I go to the front door and Jeff is still there talking to me, and telling me that he felt bad for scaring me. And I tell him through the door, trying my best to disguise any hint of fear that it was okay, that I was sorry I got spooked, and that it wasn't his fault, and I just tried my best to show him that I believed him. They eventually left, and once the coast was clear, I snuck out and ran to my friend's house next door. I didn't tell them anything, just said that I was scared, and wanted to stay there until my mom got home. I did tell my mom though, but nothing really happened and I thankfully moved to my dad's house 45 miles away three months later, and I never saw him again. The story that I'm going to tell needs to be shared. Unfortunately, this was not the first nor the last time something similar has happened to me. This story happens in the Latin America country I was living in at the time. I was 22 to 23 years old, female, finishing my master's degree in the local university. I had a part-time job as a receptionist in an institute and usually had the afternoon shift. 
I left to work every day around 8.30 p.m. to go to the bus stop, and then walk around five minutes to get home. Even though this was and is one of the most dangerous countries in the world, I lived in a relatively safe city, in a good neighborhood. Still, I walked very alert of my surroundings, and was ready to run or call somebody if needed. This is where my story starts. For a few days I had been seeing a very big, expensive, white SUV with tinted windows driving around my neighborhood. I'd never seen it before, but I just thought it was a new neighbor. After a few days I started noticing that the SUV seemed to follow me. It was always parked in a corner of my street and usually started driving when I walked past it. Obviously it gave me the creeps, so I told my boyfriend and my parents. Since the driver never did anything, just drove, not even slowly sometimes, they said it could be a coincidence, and it could be, in fact, a neighbor. What started as nighttime encounters that went on for several weeks, but not on a regular basis, turned into daytime encounters. They started to follow me around the neighborhood, sometimes passing me several times in a row, sometimes slow almost at the same speed I was walking. I discreetly took note of the license plate and always kept it in my phone. It was a pretty popular year model SUV. I started to look for it everywhere I went and I noticed they followed me to other parts of the city. This really scared me and I finally contacted the police. I didn't do it before because they're mostly useless. They told me, of course, that they couldn't do anything until it was physical. Otherwise, they could assume it was coincidental. I was in panic mode. I even dreamed about the situation. I alerted my parents and my boyfriend, who was working in another city. I alerted friends and co-workers. I even told my boss, and surprisingly, she let me go in and out of work at different schedules, so as to try to avoid the driver. This seemed to work the first week, and I thought it was over. Silly me, it wasn't. One morning I was going to the bakery to buy some bread for lunch, and there was the SUV. They started to slowly follow me. I was very anxious. I still shake thinking about it. The only thing I was thinking was that I needed to run, but didn't want to alert them. For context, my street was very long, and as there were only buildings on one side of the sidewalk, there was only a tall wall. No houses, no people passing. My goal was to arrive to the little shopping center where the bakery was, but when I saw they were still following me, I knew that that wasn't a good option. They could get me on my way out. For the first time it got confrontational. They rolled down one window and started screaming things at me. I can't even remember what, I was too scared to pay attention. So I decided to go to my friend's office, which was on the second story of the shopping center. I quickly ran up the stairs and went into her office. I told her how they were following me, and this time I had an even worse feeling about it. She got scared too, and told me to go hide in the bathroom and lock the door. A few minutes later, guess what? Surprise! A semi-fat, balding man in his 40s walks in and casually asks her about me. He said he was driving down the street when he saw his cousin enter her office. Since it was a while since he last seen me, he wanted to say hi, but I didn't hear him calling, so he parked his car and went up to greet me. He insisted he saw me walking into the office, but my friend insisted with her poker face that no one had entered her workplace since a few hours ago. He asked if she was sure, as he kept telling her the same story over and over, and she insisting there was no one and she was alone. She asked him to leave, all the while I was listening to this exchange from the bathroom. When I finally left, she closed her office and told me it was safe to go out. I cried. I was petrified with fear and terror. So was she. We immediately called the police. This time they took me more seriously. And as I had the license plate number, they agreed to patrol the neighborhood on a regular basis. My friend called her boyfriend, who was a taxi driver from the company downstairs, and he took me home because my legs were shaking and I could not move.
From that day on, I always had someone driving me in or out of work and school, or I took taxis. I think the police presence in the area spooked him, or maybe the police found him and had to talk with him. I never knew, never want to know either. I shiver only thinking about what his intentions were with me, and the fear comes back again. My parents still live in the area, as does my friend, but I eventually moved out of the city, and I never saw that man or the SUV again. I love my mom. I love sharing stories with my mom. I love visiting her and reminiscing about the past. But yesterday we were talking about stories that have happened to us, and we ended up bringing one that I forgot about. This one I'm about to tell you is something that we still wonder about. In the summer of 95, I was 11, sleeping late home alone around 10 to 11 a.m. while my parents were at work. I got woken up by the doorbell, so instinctively I hurried up down the corridor. But before I rushed to open the door, as I normally would, I remembered the many times my mom scolded me for opening the door without asking first, who is it, or looking through the spy hole to make sure it was safe to open, especially after some previous creepy experiences have already taken place at this point. I asked, who is it? But all I heard was some unintelligible mumble. So I brought a chair and stepped onto it to look through the peephole. We lived in an apartment building, and on the right of our door was the elevator and then the staircase. Since the staircase windows were on the far left corner, there was not enough natural light to help me see who it was. I just saw a man with some colorful t-shirt standing outside. I repeated the question and then strained to hear the answer. He said he was looking for my mother's maiden surname, and I said she was at work. To give you some context, both of my parents are doctors, and I don't know if that sounds weird for the US or the rest of the Western world, but in Eastern Europe in the 90s, it wasn't uncommon for grateful patients to sometimes stop by wanting to give thanks by bringing fresh fruit or vegetables, even produce from their gardens, especially those with my parents have helped, but they couldn't pay. So the man said he was bringing something for my mom. Except even in the murky light, I could see that his hands were empty. I asked, where is it? And he said he left the package at the stairs. At this point, I'm starting to get this uneasy feeling that something's not right. So I decided to be cautious and lie to him that I don't have keys. I said my parents are at work and they have told me not to open the door to strangers. So when they come back, they can help him. He started to get agitated and said he can't wait this long, and then says that he is actually bringing meat so it would get spoiled in the heat if it is left outside. I start to hesitate because I'm thinking, what if he's telling the truth? Will I get in trouble for letting the meat spoil? But then I look through the spy hole again and see his hair, which means he has his ear pressed at the door, listening in. That spooked me and I said, sorry I can't help you. Please go away and come back later when I'm not alone. He once again says that he doesn't have time to go back and forth. So he offers to leave and says he will leave the package at the stairs. So when he's gone, I will not be afraid to open the door and retrieve it myself. I keep quiet and intently observe him as he goes down the stairs and makes noise of climbing down. And then I freeze, because in the silence that ensued, I was just about to really open the door and check when I saw part of his shirt sleeve behind the corner of the stairs. He was hiding there, probably hoping I would open the door, thinking he was gone, when in fact he was preparing to, what, pounce on me, break into the apartment? I got so scared I froze and just kept on watching, standing on the chair behind the door. And finally, after what seemed like hours, but was probably maybe 10 minutes, I heard him actually descending down the stairs. I didn't open the door. I called my mom's hospital, but she couldn't be put through. So I waited for them to come back home in the afternoon. They both got worried, but proud this time that I finally did the right thing. 
A few hours later, all the kids from the building and I are at the little square playground bench area in front of it. It was buzzing with kids running around and grandparents and such. So it was completely safe. My best friend Nina and I were sitting on one of the benches when suddenly a strange man approaches us and stands next to the bench. He asks, Are you? And then he says my name. And I hesitantly confirm, although my heart starts to beat faster as I recognize the voice. It's the same man from the morning. This time, I'm not alone, so I instinctively press myself closer to Nina when he says, Well, I'm bringing something for your dad, but it's in the car and I have it parked there on the street. Come with me to help me bring it in. Encouraged by my friend's presence and all the people around, I say to him that actually my dad is home, so if he waits there I will go get him, and he could help him bring whatever he has from the car, as I am little and I cannot carry heavy things. The moment I said it, the guy got very quiet, and then quickly started walking away. Not running, just very quickly walking. My friend who already knew what happened this morning, and I ran to my apartment. I told my dad. He ran in his shorts to chase after the guy, but of course there was no trace left of him. My dad started asking away then, as once again, something typical for Eastern European countries, the grandma sitting on the balconies and benches looking at everyone and everything that's going on, like a life security system. Nobody has noticed anything, except one grandma, an old lady living at the first floor, who says that a guy approached her earlier while she was sitting on her balcony and started asking her about our family then tried to ask her for money to pay for the meat he was bringing, as he told her that my parents had purchased it from him. She told him that she has no money, but stupidly gave him a lot of information, like my name. We never heard anything about that guy, thank God, but those questions still puzzle me. What did he want? Why did he first say my mom's name, but then said he was bringing something for my dad? Was he actually focused on me? Would he have abducted me? Whatever the answer is, I don't ever want to know. In this story, I was 15 years old, living in a small town in England. Our house had a long drive on the front, walled on either side. There were large bay windows at the front, and the door was tucked away to the right, facing the boundary wall invisible from the street. In front of the door, for reasons beyond my understanding, was a little square patch of loose decorative stones, which crunched audibly whenever somebody walked across them. Stepping through the front door would land you in an empty room, serving as sort of an entryway, with the bay windows on your left, a step up to another room on your right, and the staircase ahead and to the right. The room to the right was separated from the entryway by long curtains, which on this particular occasion I had left drawn. This room housed the family PC, so naturally I spent many sleepless nights there. The PC was on a desk, immediately to the right as you stepped into the room. Beside it was a small window, through which the front door and the drive was visible. I kept the curtains on that window closed. It was around 2 a.m. I had just finished doing what the majority of frustrated teenagers would do, given internet access and privacy, and moved on to whatever browser game I was playing that week. The lights were out and my family were all upstairs. I leaned back, absent-mindedly, and in the peripheral vision I could see the darkened bay windows. I almost choked. There was a hooded man standing right up against the glass, not moving, not talking just standing there. I fought every urge to double take and pretended that I hadn't seen him staring blankly at the screen while I tried to figure out what to do. I didn't know how long he had been watching me. I leaned back to try and catch him in my peripheral again, still there. I couldn't see any of his features under the hood. It wasn't as if he had just passed the house on the street and I caught him as he happened to glance into my house. This guy had to have opened the gate and creeped down the driveway to arrive at my window. Then he moved. I was still in a dreamlike state, 
rooted to my seat. I knew the door was locked, and that my one-man audience would at least be slowed by the double-glazed windows should he try to get in. My mind raced through the options available to me. My phone was upstairs, and getting to the staircase meant walking past the windows. In the other direction was the rest of the house, including the kitchen. I could arm myself with some sort of knife. But even if I had one, I wasn't sure I could use it if the guy managed to gain entrance. There was an unmistakable crunch as the guy stepped down onto one of the loose stones in front of the door. If the curtains had been open, we'd have been facing face to face, through the glass. That was when he started muttering. I told myself that he was talking on the phone, and it wasn't until sharing this story years later that I realized I never saw a phone, nor could I make out a single word of what he was saying. For all I know, he was talking to himself. Or, and I really hate this idea, talking to me. He was inches away, blocked by only one pane of glass and a curtain, speaking in a low, hushed tone. I couldn't stand it for a moment longer. I lifted myself from the chair, with the air of a person surrounded by landmines, trying desperately to be silent. All I could hear was the muttering and the sound of blood rushing into my ears. I inched towards the kitchen and retrieved the biggest knife I could find. Then I crept back to the desk, standing behind the wall that led to the entryway. I listened intently, trying to figure out what he was saying. It was just loud enough to be audible, but it was muffled by the building. I hadn't heard any further crunching, so I knew he was still in the same spot by the door. I took a breath, readied myself as best as I could, and broke into a sprint for the staircase. I didn't stop until I reached my mom's room. I woke her up and explained what was going on. Then I made my way back to my room, mom in tow, knife in hand. My room was at the front of the house, above the bay windows. This is the detail which kept me awake for weeks afterward. There was a low roof below my window, which could easily be scaled. I had done it myself a few times in the years I spent there, and I was a kid. My bedroom window was very slightly ajar. If he had decided to, he could have simply climbed up and into my room. She peered outside and he was gone. We went back downstairs to check both entrances. He had vanished completely. I didn't sleep that night, and I kept the light on until sunrise. We got in touch with the police, but nothing came out of it. At the time, my mom was running the pub around the corner from us, so she checked the CCTV. She found the guy on tape, leaving the pub in the direction of our house. The timestamp put it at an hour or so before I saw him. To this day, I'm still unsettled by the sight of a darkened window, worried that I will look around again, and he will be there, muttering just loud enough to be heard watching. I am a 25-year-old female. I was 23 at the time this took place. I had been a college student, but had to quit due to a major surgery in my leg. So I was unemployed and had just spent a few months recovering. I was finally off crutches, but still limping around and lived in an old Victorian two-story house that is now a duplex. I live on the ground floor and a middle-aged reclusive woman occupies the whole second floor. There are separate outside entrances, you see. And I live with a male housemate that was also a friend that is a few years older than me and was employed as a security guard at a local casino. Our street is known for being seedy, and not a good neighbourhood. But I've always felt pretty safe, never had too much trouble. One night, as I was home with my roommate and my boyfriend, we were all watching movies in the living room, which is out in the front of the house. My roommate's girlfriend 
then comes over drunk with another male friend of ours. The male friend sat down to watch movies with us and immediately passed out. And my roommate and his girlfriend went to his bedroom at the back of the house and immediately started having the most insanely loud intercourse I've ever heard. She always sounded like a trashy porn star. But anyway, a few minutes into the session, my boyfriend and I were still watching the movie, and we hear a loud scream coming from the back of the house. We couldn't distinguish what it was, maybe something getting knocked over, but we figured it was just my roommate and his girlfriend being extremely loud and all over the place. Eventually, they finished, and the house was finally quiet. Our movie ended and we decided to go to bed in my room. My room is in the middle of the house, and shares a wall with my roommate's wall, and the living room on the other side. My bed was against the outside wall of my room parallel to an old window that slides up and down. The side and back of our house are pretty high off the ground. Looking out the window, it's a decent drop to the ground. Outside my window are vertical and horizontal beams that extend to hold up a little porch balcony for the lady upstairs. It really ruins the view, having beams right there. My boyfriend went into my room and took off all of his clothes and jumped into bed. I started to take off my clothes too, but stopped. When I noticed the screens of my windows missing and it being open, I had a cat that at the time was indoor only. So my first thought was, the screen is missing. Striga must have gotten out of the window. Then I noticed that the window was pushed up way more than I thought possible. I kept thinking of my cat though. I was obsessed with keeping her inside. My first thought was to look under the bed and to see if she was maybe under there. It was dark, but I saw a black mass and reached out to grab her, and thankfully she was still inside. The black mass wasn't her. It was a black hoodie. And someone was in it. I had grabbed someone's arm. For some reason, my first thought at that moment was that a friend was playing a prank on me, and it was probably someone I knew. So I kind of laughed it off and said, Hey, there's someone under here. Then I lowered my face to meet his face. And I realized I'd never seen this guy before in my life. This was not a friend and not a joke. I don't know this guy, I said in a less slightly calm voice, and my boyfriend was completely naked, and told me to grab my gun, as I was nearer to the closet than he was. Stay where you are, he screamed at the mass under the bed. The guy cooperated. I threw my boyfriend a robe, and he put it on, and jumped out of the bed near the closet where I was. He took the gun, and pointed it at the bed and told the guy to come out slowly with his hands out. Since my roommate is a security guard, I ran to wake him up for backup. He rushed into the room, and the three of us stood there with a teenage boy wearing a black hoodie coming out from under the bed. We were all kind of in shock, and we started to question the kid, who cooperated with us completely. He was being quiet and humble. His eyes shook violently from side to side, as if he was high or something. My roommate searched him. We emptied his pockets, and he had condoms, lube, porn advertisements from the back of a dirty magazine, and some dirty pills that he told us were Vicodin, but they were really just extra strength ibuprofen. He also had a pair of my dirty underwear in his pocket. Dirty underwear? That I had just had my period all over. That was the most disgusting part. We found ID on him as well, and a business card from a youth probation officer, so clearly he was a troublemaker. We also found a piece of paper with names and phone numbers on it 
that indicated he lived with his mother in a hotel room in a notorious drug motel that catered to prostitutes and men. His high school ID was from Hooper High, and he was clearly from the local Hooper Native American tribe, or at least part Hooper Native. When we saw he had no weapons, we started questioning why he was in my bedroom under the bed with all that stuff, and asked if he realised how serious this was. He quietly replied that he had sex from the street and thought he could have some. Basically, he was a horny teenage boy on some sort of drug, riding his bike around at night, and my roommate's trashy girlfriend's sex noises were like a siren song in the night to this kid. He was so overcome by his horniness that he scaled the scaffolding and beams near my open window and crawled in under my bed, probably to masturbate, to what to he thought he was hearing in the next room. He probably jizzed on my underwear. He then kept apologising and saying he was sorry and God knows what. I was in shock and disgusted and wondered if he would have raped me if I'd have been alone. But we all felt a little compassion for the stupid kid. His fate was basically in our hands at that point, and we debated whether or not to call the police. We finally decided not to, and we basically lectured him and told him how lucky he was that he crawled into my window, and not someone else's, because we could have shot him or called the police and had him arrested, and whatever he was on for probation for would have been a lot worse. He kept thanking us and was super humble at that point. My roommate then escorted him out the front door and took his bike that he had left on the lawn and walked him to his shitty motel and watched him go inside. We kept all of his stuff. He didn't have money, just trash IDs and phone numbers and made sure to tell him we had his IDs and we knew where he lived. We had his mum's number and his probation officer's number and that if we ever saw him on the street again, he'd regret it. A drunk friend and my other roommate's girlfriend slept through the entire ordeal, and we told them next morning what had happened whilst they slept. Okay, so this all happened about three years ago, give or take. I was around 17 years old. I am not going to dramatize anything. But let me go ahead and say that I think, personally, that this is a pretty bizarre story. There are some details about my actual relationship I'm going to leave out. My ex-girlfriend Jane and I lived about an hour away from each other. We met at a park out of state and ended up living kind of close. We hit it off and dated a month after we met. Our entire relationship lasted a year and she was my first girlfriend. From the very beginning of the relationship, she would discuss her best friend named Patrick. He was in his late twenties, and she, as a reminder, was seventeen, and worked in a bookstore. He lived in her town, and had known him since she was thirteen. From very early on, I thought the story she would tell about him were outlandish. She would talk about watching him get into bar fights with a guy that went by the name Hammer. How once they pretended to rob a gas station but left money on the counter and had to jump off a roof to escape security in which Patrick broke his ankle. On another occasion Patrick got a brand new Mustang that they wanted to crash into a lake. 
So they jumped out of it at the last second. This tale she told me towards the end of our relationship, at which point I was completely sceptical of everything she said. You get the idea. The stories she said were clearly exaggerated, or downright fake. Part of me thought she was just trying to impress me for whatever reason. Here are some other important facts that I don't really know where to put, so I'll put them here. Jane was an artist. She drew all the time, in her journal and on little notes. She rarely drew people, as they actually were anyway. She drew people as monsters or animals. For example, she always drew me as a giraffe. She was good at it. Patrick's last name, according to her, was pronounced and spelt a certain way. Willington. Patrick Willington. Patrick's dad owned a successful company out of state that Patrick would inherit. Jane had a much older brother, who was in his late twenties as well, that had joined the military and moved out to Korea. She only saw him every few years or so. Okay, back to the story. Jane would tell me that Patrick was very protective of her. She would tell him about me, and he would always be unsure of what he thought. She said he wanted to beat me up sometimes, and that he'd hurt me if I hurt her. If she told him about something silly I did, he'd think I was an idiot and call me stupid. He also thought I was gay. This is, of course, all second-hand information. Never once in the entire relationship do I think I spoke to him. I'd also like to remind everyone that this was my first relationship. I was very insecure, very confused, and there was more going on in that it complicated some things. I did not have the best rationality, as you may have deduced from how weird this sounds. The thing is, I really did have no reason not to believe her. She had no reason to lie about any of this, but I was still sceptical. Sometimes, Jane would go to Patrick's house really late at night. She said she'd sometimes sleep on his couch and that he would literally throw her out of the house in the morning. Sometimes said she had to sneak out of her house to go to his. He lived within walking distance, apparently. One time later in the relationship, Patrick invited her on an out-of-state trip back to his hometown. They were going to stay in a mountain cabin for a week. I was happy about that. I was more upset when she said she wouldn't tell her parents and that they'd leave on a bus in the morning. Now, at this point in the relationship, I was very unsure of what exactly was going on with this Patrick person. But if Jane said that if I told her parents about the trip, that she would be unable to go, and that Patrick would hate me and she'd be pissed. It was important to her because Patrick, apparently, would be forced to move away soon to work at his dad's company. And she said she'd never see him again. So she needed to go. Well, when the day came for her to leave, as I also discussed this with friends and family at the time, Patrick never showed up to get her or whatever. She was very upset even though he'd be back in town one more time. Oh, another tidbit. Jane's parents never once mentioned Patrick, ever. She never brought him up around either. The only time she mentioned Patrick to anyone else was to my dad, once, after we broke up. She told my dad one of the outlandish stories I mentioned why she met my dad after we broke up 
is for a different unrelated reason. My dad was flabbergasted. Basically, I had told him about all of this, but hearing it in person was crazy. Patrick was supposed to have a birthday party once, before the mountain cabin trip thing happened. I was invited, and it was going to be at his house starting at midnight. I said I couldn't go to that, but that I'd get him a present. I got him some toolkit thing she said he'd like, and I gave it to her for him. She said she brought it, and that he did in fact like it. She said the party lasted until 6am. Patrick sent me a text from her work phone once, when she was with him. It was standard behaviour for him. He said I was a pansy or something, and that he would beat me up, and that was early on. I know things are getting out of order, I'm just trying to say them as I remember. Now here is where things get very interesting. Jane lived nearby an elementary school. She walked with me there and said his house was close. So she leads me to the back of the school where there is woodlands. She brings me to the edge of the woods and has me look in. I see a very old wooden tin house structure. It has broken windows, is filthy and is falling apart. The path to it is covered by bushes and trees. She said that was the house. Oh, and at that point he had apparently moved out of state completely. I asked if she was joking, and she said no, and that he wasn't very tidy even when he did live there. I thought briefly that maybe the house was just funny looking. Looking on the outside, but actually good on the inside. But there was no way it was. It was abandoned. Anyway. That same day, she asked if I wanted to go inside. It was getting hot, getting dark, and no one knew exactly where we were, and I didn't want to get cut up by bushes or go into the sketchy house. So I said, politely, maybe another time. She insisted, saying that Patrick wanted us to check up on things, but eventually gave up as this was close to the end of our relationship. I asked her a few more questions. You went through the bushes and stuff every time you went to see him? She said yes, but that they had overgrown since he left. I also asked about how he drove out of his house, how anyone else visited him, how he got his mail. She eventually realized that maybe I didn't exactly believe her and got angry. I said I was sorry, and that it was just different to me, but she insisted it was all true. I let it go. Well, we ended up breaking up shortly after, but I had a hard time coping with the breakup, and ended up speaking with her again later. She was on a bus with her class going on some trip. Well, I lost connection with her, and called her back. A young man then answered. I asked who it was, and he said his name was Patrick Wilson, not Willington. So I opened up with a question about his last name, and also why he had her phone. He said that was always his last name, and said that he was on his office phone. I kept asking him questions about himself that only the real Patrick would know. I heard noises in the background. He would pause for a minute before answering. I think she just handed the phone to a classmate and told him what to say. Frankly, that's the only real answer to that. Well, he hung up and I called her back. Jane answered and said that Patrick told her I somehow got connected to his phone since he was in her recent contacts or something. Clearly BS. But I played along, asking one more time about the last name, to which she said she had no idea what I was talking about, saying it was always Wilson, and left it at that. Oh, and he obviously wanted to beat me up, because I broke her heart. Well, I kept speaking to her for a week or two, 
and we both finally got closure about the whole thing. But I was recounting this experience with a friend and realised something. Probably just a creepy coincidence. But I had seen Jane was an artist and she always drew people as other things. Well, I saw many drawings of Patrick. She said he always wore this dark coat and ripped pants or something. She, as usual, didn't draw him as a human, she drew him as a skeleton. Really creeped me out for some reason. I tried using Google Earth to look at where his house was, since I remember exactly where she showed me. The trees are too thick to see and know, and there is construction nearby, so it may not even be accessible anymore. I've not gone back there in person since, as it's too far away, and also close to her house. I've googled and researched countless Patricks in the way they were both said, and anything I could remember to no useful results. She used to mention him on social media sometimes. A friend of mine who had trouble grasping all of this found her profile and saw him mentioned recently too. So I have a few theories. Patrick was just a sort of imaginary character that she made up to fill the place of her much older brother who moved away when she didn't often see him. Her brother and Patrick were the same age after all and kind of had similar personalities as I did meet her brother once. Secondly, it may have all have been bullshit she made up for whatever reason to impress me sometimes, to coerce me other times. The third is that it was part of a much greater disorder or problem which is possible as Jane did have them. Or four, Patrick did exist only in some way, shape or form, but she highly exaggerated him and rarely saw him. So she told me whatever she wanted about him and it may not be creepy to all of you since you're outside my social circle. But like I said, that's why I'm sharing this. Because to me, personally, I was really bothered by this. Jane had a tendency to be a very violent and threatening person. Why did she make all of it up? Why did she show me that house and say it was his? What was in the house? Regardless of if anyone lived there. Did she ever actually go in? Like she said she did? Did she sleep there sometimes? Or visit late at night? If so, what in the world was she doing? Did someone really somehow live there? Why did she draw him as a skeleton? Why did he have such strong feelings about me? Why did she change his last name? Why did she do all these weird things with the phone and the classmate? How many of her other loved ones knew about this? And what would have happened if I'd have gone into that house with her? Some of this is probably my heightened anxiety. But I do think it's a weird story. Either way, it's a relief that we're broken up. So I grew up as a middle class suburban dweeb. Middle son in a waspy family in a mostly stable home. Like many such children, I was left to my own devices quite a bit. When the first modem made its way into the house, along with AOL, I was hooked on the chat rooms. That was a pretty momentous occasion for me. Let me explain. I was a sexually precarious child. Before my teens, I was already desperate for it, despite not knowing what it actually meant. There wasn't really an outlet for it though. So it mostly meant me spending huge amounts of time alone in the room, thinking abstractly about the topic. When chat rooms became available, I entered the equation, because it gave me a wealth of people to talk about the topic with, and I was basically addicted. I would lurk in sexually explicit chat rooms for hours on end. After years of being a lurker, casually observing the discourse in the chat rooms, I started participating. Being the internet, it was mostly men. 
but I was crazed, and there was a tension. I began to have pretty lucid chats, leading to cybersex. That was the days before the proliferation of digital cameras, or even scanners, so it was strictly text. I went on for a little while, in the generic hookup style chat rooms, I'd cyber with anyone who came my way. When they'd inevitably ask for my location, I'd give a suburb about 30 or 40 minutes away from where I really was. Until one day, I remember very clearly I'd been cybering with one guy in his late teens, only a handful of years older than me. When he asked where I lived, I lied, and returned the question to him. He replied that he lived in the suburb that I actually lived in. I confessed my lie, saying that I'd only lied to keep creepers away, and he commended me for the clever idea. And so it got to be that I'd cyber with this guy every couple of days. He'd ask me about phone sex, but I didn't want to get a call on my parents' line. Our sessions turned into discussions of what we would do if we met up. He said he knew the perfect place we could play in his car, and asked where a safe spot could be so that he could pick me up. I mentioned a park that was several blocks away. Things continued this way, strictly in the realm of fantasy for a while. Eventually, though, I started to lose interest. I wouldn't sign on for weeks at a time, then months, and then whenever I did, he would be there, ready to pick up where I left off. I was usually willing to oblige, because it was all just harmless idle fantasy. Years later, I'd all but forgotten about my account. We didn't have AOL anymore, and I'd made a newer account on my AIM. About five years after all of this had started, I was moving into my college dorm and setting up my new laptop when I remembered my old handle and signed back in. It had been years since I'd last signed on. Surely enough, who I am's me first but my old friend. He asked me what I've up to and I told him that I've moved. Ah, oh, shucks, he replies. We never did meet up. Yeah, I said. Bummer. It's a shame that date didn't work out. What date, I asked. We were going to meet in Walgreens on your block, but you chickened out. I replied, Oh, I don't think I remember that. I was racking my brains to recall such an event. There was in fact a Walgreens on my block, but it was relatively new. We were going to meet in the parking lot, but you drove away before I could talk to you. I assured him he was mistaken, as I hadn't spoken to him since I'd gotten my license. No man, for real, you were going to meet me in that black Ford Focus with the bike rack and the alien sticker on the back. The room seemed to swim. I felt like I was falling backwards. He correctly identified the car I was driving, but I'd never told him about it, nor mentioned the tiny details, nor sent him a picture that included my face. I'd sure I'd never set anything up. Was he deliberately messing with me? Just trying to let me know that he'd found me? Or had the years since this happened twisted my mind? Had he convinced himself that him stalking me was a meeting we'd arranged? I blocked him and tried to forget about it. I wasn't living in the same town anymore. And even though his stalking prowess was apparently good, I was a significant distance away, and a pretty athletic guy. If he found me again, I didn't think I'd have much to worry about. I'd nearly forgotten about the whole thing until the other day. This was well over a decade later at this point. My older brother and I were catching up, lamenting getting older. I told him that there was an old member of my graduating class that had already gone to jail for a felony and served his time. This led to a discussion about friends, classmates and such who had been arrested. He led with, Remember Charles? I played football with him. He was arresting for sexing up kids he met online. Crazy! I looked up the case. He'd been tried and convicted for a slew of sex crimes. He had apparently been using the social sites like Zanga, MySpace and Friendster to meet young boys. He blackmailed and assaulted some of them when they wanted to break it off. The more I read, the more I got a heavy feeling in my stomach. I googled his AIM handle. It wasn't terribly unique. 
there were similar accounts named on all sorts of sites, which were definitely not him. But one, deeper in the results, was an account on a rollerblading forum. Skimming this account's post, I was positive it was the same person I'd been chatting with. Clicking the user profile statistics page, the last login was precisely the day before my brother's friend was arrested. At this point, I have more questions than answers. Could it really have been him? If it was, was it random chance? Did he know me through my brother? Is that how he was able to put a face to a name? Was he waiting in my neighborhood on purpose? Or was it coincidence?